So viruses and bacteria. Genetic diversity in prokaryotes is important, uh, just like it is in any other organism. Now, if we remember prokaryotic, pro means no, there is no nucleus in a prokaryote. So these are organisms that have their DNA free floating within them. Factors that increase genetic diversity in prokaryotes include rapid reproduction. They can reproduce very quickly. They don't have to worry about uh, dis dismantling the nucleus and separating everything. And they basically just make a copy and split in half. Mutations add to genetic diversity. So those are our errors. And we're gonna talk about those a lot more in the coming days. Genetic recombination. So this is like we talked about sexual reproduction where it um, creates more combinations than we've seen in the past. Genetic recombination occurs in prokaryotes as well. They just don't have the same kind of sexual reproduction that we see in other organisms. So for genetic recombination in bacteria, we have three different things we're gonna look at. Transformation, transduction, and conjugation, okay? Transformation, transduction, and conjugation. Transformation is taking a foreign DNA from your surroundings. So this is when a bacteria will get DNA from something in its surroundings. Generally, this happens by having some other bacteria that dies in the surroundings, decays, which causes the DNA to be free floating in the surroundings. And it can then pick up that piece of DNA and incorporate it into its genome and begin using it. We saw this first um, documented with Griffith, which we're gonna study starting with our next lesson. Okay, so the next time I see you, we'll, we'll look at Griffith. But what he did is he took some bacteria that was alive, bacteria that was dead. He did some other things with it. We'll talk about it a lot more later. Now, plasmids. Plasmids are a small ring of DNA that carries just a few genes. It's not part of the normal genome. And if you remember when we talked about plasmids, or I'm sorry, we talked about prokaryotes. In prokaryotes, their DNA is not enclosed in that nucleus. It's free floating. It tends to be in a, like a, a ring, a chain. Think of like a necklace that's all bunched together in one area, okay? By, Connecting it, it keeps it from getting too tangled and knotted. But we have this one area that has all the DNA. Now a plasmid is going to be a little circle elsewhere, not part of that, a little circle that has just a few genes on it. And it will be read within the cell like the other DNA is. So it replicates separately from the bacterial chromosome and can carry genes for things like antibiotic resistance. But it is often used for genetic engineering, including gene cloning. Now, when we think of cloning, we think of things like Dolly the sheep that was cloned and making identical copies of people and that, but gene cloning, that's just one little piece of the DNA. Remember, a gene is just a little segment and we can make extra copies of that through plasmids. Now, why would this be important? All right, so we can take the gene that we want to be replicated, we can, introduce that into a plasmid. So we take that gene, put it in a plasmid, put it into a bacteria. It's then going to use that. So the bacteria can reproduce and it creates more of these plasmids. These plasmids are read by the bacteria. And we're gonna talk about how that works in the next coming days. And by reading it, we can create a product. Now that product can be varied, anything from things like human growth hormone so when there are metabolic disorders and things that cause uh, problems with growth, there's not enough production of that growth hormone, we can give produced growth hormone to these individuals. Now, this wasn't so easy before. We do the same thing with insulin for people who are diabetic. It used to be if you were diabetic, you would use either uh, porcine or bovine insulin. That means they would have to slaughter pigs or cows, and they would then take the insulin out of them. And once they extract it out of that dead animal, they then would basically clean it and give it to people to be able to use. Now we don't have to do that. 
Now we do it with bacteria in petri dishes, in laboratories, and we can create huge quantities of it. Okay, so we can mass produce it. It can be very cheap now. That's the production of it can be very cheap. That doesn't mean acquiring it is very cheap. Uh, there's the whole medical processing companies and business and all that. But we can produce this now that can be given to growth hormones, insulin. We can make a protein, an enzyme that dissolves the clot in an artery to prevent heart attacks. Okay, so we do this using bacteria. We basically trick the bacteria into making what we need. We've also used it to do things like trying to produce bacteria that will clean up toxic waste. So we're creating all these problems, but we're also trying to fix these problems. We can use this whole idea to insert genes to make food crops more resistant to pests. So we can use less pesticides. Now a pesticide is a poison that is sprayed on plants so that the bugs won't eat them. So the idea is, if the plant is naturally resistant to the pests, we don't have to spray poisons on them. So when you hear of GMOs, okay, a GMO means genetically modified organism. If we look at what that means, that means it's something that's not in its original form. Scientifically speaking, most of the foods we eat are genetically modified. So corn originally about the size of your index finger. Very, very starchy, not all that tasty. Okay, so very small, very starchy. And now we get ears of corn that are huge, and very sweet and juicy. That's been through selective breeding. So we've modified that organism through selective breeding. Now, when you hear GMO, what they're talking about is this kind of thing where we've inserted genes into it. So it's been modified through gene therapy where we've inserted this gene. It then produces whatever protein that gene tells it to produce that is making it more resistant to pests. So it is one of those topics that is kind of controversial because how much study has there been done? How much money has been put into it? All of those kinds of things. The idea would be that if we can safely insert a gene into crops, especially food crops, then we would have less loss of food to pests. So we would have crops that more food that is usable. That means that we could uh, share more food. So it, we wouldn't have small crops, we'd have gigantic crops because we wouldn't have as much waste. But also we wouldn't have to use pesticides, which means spraying those poisons on it. So it would reduce the need for things like uh, the pesticide distribution, which takes energy, whether it's crop, um, crop dusting flights or whether how it's sprayed on, whatever it is, but it would reduce that, it would reduce the poison use. So there's lots of good reasons for this. Whether they are um, safe or not is still kind of one of those controversial things. Generally speaking, what you're gonna find out there is going to be very safe for consumption um, when you see foods that say non-GMO, that's most foods right now because we haven't had the ability to do gene therapy on all of the different types of foods, okay? So something saying non-GMO is a very vague term. It really doesn't mean anything. So gene cloning, again, this is one of the reasons we would want to do this. Transduction. So we had, let's go back up here real quick, just so we have a real clear understanding, transformation. Transformation is taking something from the environment, okay? Taking DNA from the environment. Transduction is when a virus injects a piece of DNA, okay? So a virus, this is a bacteriophage, a virus that will actually attach to a bacteria, inject DNA, that DNA becomes part of the genome and it basically takes over the cell, it can cause a recombination of DNA. Okay. So transformation is taking it from the environment. Transduction is when it's given by a virus.
Conjugation. Conjugation in English means when I'm taking two words and put them together, right? That's a conjugated word. So we are gonna take two things, put them together. We have two different cells. We're gonna connect them and trade pieces of DNA. So here we have two different bacteria. This is a bridge that is connecting them or a tunnel. It's called a sex pillus. And it basically just sends a little piece of DNA over. That's as close to sex as it happens with bacteria. Now, sometimes it's a great distance between them. Sometimes they will actually be right against each other and basically open up just a little hole in the two membranes and trade a piece of DNA. So by doing this, we've recombined the DNA. We've gotten a new mix of information and new things that we can create. Through these types of things is how we are looking at um, having new sets of genes, and it does help lead to things like antibiotic resistance. Now, bacteria versus viruses. So we're gonna kind of segue into our viruses here. Bacteria are a prokaryotic cell. They carry out all of the like hallmarks of life. It meets the criteria for saying it is a cell. Most bacteria are free living and some are parasitic. That means it has to have a host. They're relatively large in size, uh, microscopically speaking. They are pretty big compared to other cells. And we use antibiotics to kill them. Okay, antibiotics can kill bacteria. A virus is not a living cell. It doesn't have ribosomes. It doesn't have cytoplasm. It doesn't have all the things that we think of for life. What it does have is protein on the outside and a nucleic acid in the center. Okay, think of a peanut butter cup. It's, you know, one thing on the outside, one thing in the center, but that's it. Okay. It is what we call an obligate intracellular parasite. It is required to be inside a host cell in order for it to replicate. Okay, so it is an obligate intracellular parasite. It's required to be inside something else. And it is about one one thousandth of the size of a bacteria. So if we stacked up a thousand viruses, that's about the size of one bacteria. So they're really tiny. We can have thousands of them attacking one bacteria at a time thousands and thousands of them attacking one of your cells at a time because your cells being eukaryotic are even larger. Antibiotics will not kill a virus. I can't give you penicillin or ampicillin or any of those other um, Keflex, any of those other antibiotics to kill a virus. They don't kill viruses. We use vaccines to help prevent infections. And we're gonna talk about that a little more in a little bit. And we can also have what are called antiviral treatments. So a vaccine is going to give your body like a plan of what might come so it knows how to attack it. And an antiviral treatment helps your body attack it. So, but antiviral treatments have to be given usually within 24 to 48 hours of the onset of whatever the illness is. Most people within 48 hours aren't really feeling bad enough to even bother to go to the doctor. So these aren't used nearly as often because by then it's too late. Some of them that are used and are used frequently include ones for things like shingles. People who have shingles, it tends to reoccur. So they, like at the first sign, they're like, wait a minute, I need to get those antivirals so it help, can help treat that. And we'll talk about that more towards the end of this presentation. So a virus is very small. It is less than the size of a ribosome usually. And the components include a nucleic acid inside, that would be the little purple string, and a capsid, that's the outside here. Okay, it's a protein basically to hold it. And that nucleic acid on the inside could be DNA or RNA, and it could be single or double stranded. The capsid on the outside is just a protein shell, like our peanut butter cup. 
Now, some viruses also have what we call the viral envelope. Now, the envelope is on the outside and it helps it to attach to cells and to kind of hide it. You could, if this was a peanut butter cup, this would be our peanut butter, this would be our chocolate, and this would be that foil wrapper. They do have what is called a limited host range. That means that they don't just randomly infect every cell. So human cold virus, rhinovirus, affects the upper respiratory tract. So you don't get a cold virus in your left big toe. It doesn't work that way. They can infect the respiratory tract and the, usually it's upper respiratory tract. So we're looking at the upper lungs and, and the, the nose, the sinuses look like that. Okay, so they are limited in what they attack. They often have a, usually, almost always, have a limited uh, range as to what the host species is. Okay, you guys may have heard of swine flu or bird flu, and they, it, these are things that were originally would only infect, like bird flu, infected birds, and it didn't infect us because it attacked the bird system. The problem is, is when it does what we call jumping the species, and so it can mutate, and now it can attack the bird, but because the envelope has a mutation, now our cells, it will attach to and can attack. That's when we have problems, okay? And we're gonna talk about COVID-19 in just a couple of minutes. And that is one of the things that is believed to have happened is that it was able to have a mutation in this outer envelope, which allowed it to infect humans. Now viruses have to reproduce within a host cell. Okay, they have to be in a host cell to reproduce. So there's our nucleic acid, there's our capsid, that's our envelope. Now, viruses are not all built the same. They have different shapes to them and they attach differently to our cells and different cells. This is called a tobacco mosaic virus, okay? It's like a spiral. You can see the RNA inside there is in this spiral. And then we wrap around it this protein to help kind of keep it safe. Here we have, this is adenovirus. So you can see it has this like geometric shape to it with these little spikes sticking off. This is an example of a coronavirus. It's a sphere with these spikes all sticking all over it. And this one is a bacteriophage. This one has, if any of you ever watched Jimmy Neutron when you were little, this is the shape they tend to show in there. So we have this head up here, which is protein and the DNA is inside. This one to me is super cool because it has these legs on it, which are kind of like landing gear and it'll land on the cell with these legs and then it actually has a spike that'll pop down into the cell and inject its DNA. So it uses these legs to attach to the cell, whereas these three, they have kind of these like spiky things on the outside. They all work kind of like Velcro to attach to a cell. Okay. Now, COVID-19 is a coronavirus. This is a group of viruses. So here we have, this is the corona of the sun during a, a eclipse. You can see it has kind of like this hazy area around the outside. That's why these are called a coronavirus. So you can see the center and kind of a hazy area outside. So they called it a coronavirus. Coronavirus actually refers to a group of viruses that include the rhinovirus, SARS, MERS, and COVID-19. Okay, so, um, Middle Eastern Respiratory uh, Syndrome, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. So these are different types of respiratory illnesses. Rhinovirus, this is what we call um, the common cold. So they all have this kind of shape. So when somebody says that they have coronavirus, that's really generic. It's kind of like saying you're eating a sandwich. I get a general idea of what's going on, but it's not specific. When you have a cold, you have a coronavirus. So COVID-19 is a very specific coronavirus, all right? That's like saying, 
I'm having a ham and Swiss on rye, which I don't know why you do, that's gross, but okay. So I wanna show you a little bit about the structure of COVID-19 because it's really kind of cool. I found this site when I was trying to find some information for you guys. And I highly, highly recommend take a few minutes to take a look at this when you have time because it is super cool. It's all like interactive 3D models. So this spinning thing here, this is a model of the coronavirus. And it will tell you some background information. But I want to look here. Oh, come on. You can do it, computer. I believe in you. There. So if we were to look at the outside, it looks like this. If we were to split it in half and look at the inside, so here we see we have our RNA and it's wrapped in a protein just to keep it all from tangling too much. We have then our outer layer and these are the spikes that you saw. They're built like this. And these spikes are what allow it to attach to our cells. So remember we talked about uh, the signals on the outside of the cell and the proteins and all that. This is what kind of attaches to that. Okay, so let me scroll down a little bit. So again, here's our virus. Here's how it would um, attach to a lung cell. So these spikes have a piece that is going to look for receptor proteins. Remember we talked about those receptor proteins? And if they match up, if they meet and they can bind, that's when things get crazy. So if they can match up, it will grab a hold and these two will pop together. Okay, so they're gonna, remember we talked about endocytosis and exocytosis and how the membranes are membranes are membranes and they can all start popping together and make bigger bubbles. That's basically what's gonna happen. And then it opens up and dumps the RNA in. Once it's in the cells, then we have, see here's our endoplasmic reticulum. It can start being red and the cell can start doing things with it. We're gonna kind of skip ahead a little bit. All right, antibodies. The whole point in getting a vaccine is to give your body the playbook for the other team. So I know a lot of you do sports, if you knew all the plays the other team had, it would make it super easy to win, right? So if you were in a battle and you knew what the plans for the enemy is, then it's easy to find it and defeat it. That's what a vaccine does. So the vaccine, now if we're talking about COVID-19, the vaccine is going to give you the instructions for these spikes. And we're going to make Oh, there's all of our, remember we talked about having uh, the messengers inside and that cascading reaction. There's that happening. All right. So what we want to do is to start by preventing the virus from actually entering the cell. We want this to not happen. So, sorry, I'm trying to find the right image here. Here's our immune response. So what we do is we look at taking either a weakened virus, inactivated virus, or pieces of the virus. That's how we make a vaccine. Usually you're gonna be looking at things like pieces of the outer envelope, okay? So if we take those little spikes, and we show your body what those spikes look like, then they can go, oh, you know what? I can, I can break those, no problem. And if the spikes can't work, they can't attach to your cells. They can't attach to your cells, they can't make you sick. Now, it can still get into your body, but it might not make you sick. This is why even if you've been vaccinated, you might still be able to get other people sick because it's still gotten into your body and it could still be there, which means you can give it off. It just means it's not making you sick. So we create these safe things 
that we inject into the body and then the body can start working against it. Okay, now one of the things that makes it really hard to work with some of these, if we look at rhinoviruses as a cold, HIV, influenza, now the flu vaccine every year is the same kind of thing. We give you a dose of information of what that flu is gonna look like. Now the flu mutates very fast, so every year it's a little bit different. That's why you need a new flu shot every year. But we here's the genome, we know what it is, we can give you the plans, but look at COVID-19, how big the genome is. Now that means how many base pairs, which is gonna make more sense when we talk uh, um, in our next lesson. The genome for COVID-19 is huge compared to even Ebola, flu, Zika, HIV, common cold. So that, that's why this one is able to kind of take hold really fast is it's harder for us to be able to combat it. All right, um, it has an amazing proofreading system, which we're gonna talk about how that works with DNA and the proofreading. We'll get into all this kind of stuff a little bit more in our next lesson. But you can see here that this is not a particularly complex idea where we have a nucleic acid on the inside, protein on the outside, these spikes stick to our cells like Velcro and we can inject the DNA in, but it can cause a whole lot of havoc. Okay, now back here, a bacteriophage, this is a type of bacteria um, that will attack, again, it has these little landing feet and it injects into the bacteria. So a bacteriophage just means a virus that infects a bacteria. Okay. Um, we will, look at, let's see, question was asked, how do we inactivate? A virus, our body creates what are called antibodies. So it, when we get those plans, see if I can find that section again. When, we, when our body gets those plans, so that vaccine, it says, okay, here's what it's gonna look like. And then our body will make particles called antibodies that can attach. And when they are working correctly, they will attach to these spikes and when it attaches to these spikes, it can attach to ourselves. Okay, so it's not that we have destroyed the virus. We've just made the virus so it can't attack us. That's an antibody. Okay, and by getting the vaccine, your body gets those plans and can start making those antibodies. It'll keep a little bit in the system. And then when it's there, it triggers your immune system to send a response. It's like, oh, no, no, no. This is here, this is a problem, send a huge army, go kill this. Now, when you get your vaccine, it does not matter what vaccine you get. It doesn't matter if it's Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, it doesn't matter. They're all gonna do approximately the same thing. The first vaccine, your body's never seen it before, okay? So it's like, oh, what's this? Okay, sure, whatever. The next dose, you probably have heard that people have a greater reaction. And that's because at that point, your body goes, wait, that's a bad guy. And it starts to react. And your body reacts, the first thing it does when it senses an invader is kick up the heat. Remember we talked about how proteins can be denatured with heat? Well, the outside of our virus, that's all protein. So if I break it down, it can't do anything, right? So let's kick up the heat and try to kill it. What your body doesn't know right away is that the vaccine isn't actually dangerous. It's just got these particles in there. So it sees it, it freaks out, and then it goes, oh, wait a minute. That's okay. You're good. No, no, no worries. We're good. Okay. And it chills out. So people who get that second dose and they have that immune response, so it's not that you're sick. Your immune system has just been triggered and put in a hyperdrive because it's like, we don't want to get sick. That's bad. No infections here. So it kicks on it starts to respond and then it goes, oh, there's nothing here. Okay, we're good. So people who get that second injection usually have about a 24 hour response. So a day or so, maybe two days at most where they just kind of feel eh, and they might get a fever, body aches, that kind of thing. And that's your body's response. So it's actually kind of a good thing. It's, it's telling you that your body knows what it's supposed to be doing. 
It knows how to fight it. It knows what's going on. Now I got my second dose over spring break and I had about a 24 hour period where I did not feel good. I had a fever. I wasn't feeling great, but then it went away very quickly. And it's not fun, definitely, but it is so nice to know now that my body knows what it needs to do. And if I, if I get infected by that virus, the chances of me getting so sick that I have to be hospitalized are very small because my body knows how to fight it now. So the vaccine doesn't mean you won't get sick. The vaccine means that your body has help fighting it if you do get sick. So it could get in there, but your body can fight it. Okay, a couple questions have popped up here. Um, is it just white blood cells that interact with them or is it all cells? Do they react differently? Yes, so different viruses actually infect and attack different cells. Okay, so this one in particular starts with the respiratory system, but they do know that it goes into the blood. So this is, that's part of why this is weird and a bit hard for us to fight is because it's not just respiratory. It's not just making it hard to breathe, causing pneumonia, things along those lines. They have found that it is leading to the blood um, sticking together and clumping, causing things like heart attack, stroke, embolism, things along those lines. So this one has been particularly hard because it's not, uh, the symptoms can be ranging anywhere from cough, sneezing, cold type things, all the way to heart attacks. So it's, it's really a weird one. And that's why it's been so hard to fight. Um, these, there's been things about, well, kids don't get it. Teens don't get it. Um, school age kids don't get it. Well, school age kids haven't been exposed to it. You guys have all been home. Now that we are finding that they are being exposed to it, they are having some of the same kinds of symptoms. And I will tell you that um, I have a former student who graduated last June and him and I are still in, in contact, we're still close. And in July, he was hospitalized for a lung embolism. So here's a healthy working 18 year old young man who wound up in the hospital because he, uh, the COVID caused him to develop pneumonia, that pneumonia cause other problems and he wound up having a lung embolism. Now what that is, is a blood clot in the lung tissue, okay? That's bad, okay? The heart attack is a blood clot to the heart and that's bad, blood clot in the lung, that's bad. So he was hospitalized for quite some time. Um, he, he's fine, he was, you know, he's safe, released, everything. But months later, he is still having breathing issues. Um, working at Amazon, like a lot of you guys here in the Inland Empire do, uh, they actually had to change his work schedule because he wasn't able to breathe well to do the job he had been doing. They actually had to modify his work and change his work for him. So they can have long-term effects. And we really don't understand everything about it yet. This vaccine was developed quickly. And a lot of people have been like, that's too fast. I'm seeing questions pop up. So I'm trying to respond to those as we go. Um, it was developed very quickly, but it's not because it went too fast. It's because we got rid of a lot of the bureaucracy part of it. So if you think about when a company is trying to make a new medication, they have a lot of paperwork that has to go to the next step, which has to be read and approved and it's in a stack and where is it in the stack and all of that. With COVID-19, everybody wants this one like done now. So it automatically goes to the top of the stack it gets read, it gets approved, it gets sent on. So you're not having all that waiting period. It's not that they've taken shortcuts in safety. It's that we've cut out all of the paperwork side and made things go a little faster. Plus, we are able to communicate worldwide. Now, I'm gonna go back over here. I'm gonna skip ahead just a little bit. We'll come back. but I wanna show you here. Emerging viruses are ones that are new. They mutated to attack humans. The last time we had something like we're having right now was in 1918, okay? Huge flu pandemic. You know how they stopped this one? One, a lot of people died. 
a huge number of people died. It, this had a, if you look at the um, population as on a graph, you will see a huge dip in population at that time, okay? Biggest way that you were able to slow this besides death was masks. In 1918, they were using masks and telling people to mask and people were like, oh, okay, sure. Um, it wasn't a political thing like it is now. It is a health thing, okay? Masks were for health reasons. We look at, hmm, where's my other one? It's been back that way. There we go. Um, smallpox. Smallpox was eradicated in 1979 due to a worldwide vaccination campaign. So this was international across the entire world. Vaccinations try to get everybody vaccinated, okay? It is impossible to vaccinate 100% of the population because there are people who have health conditions that cannot be vaccinated without causing them problems, including things like death. If you have cancer and you are undergoing uh, radiation treatment, that has damaged your immune system. And just by giving you a vaccine, that's enough that it could kill you. So not everybody can be vaccinated, but we can vaccinate enough of the population that the few people who can't be, everyone around them is vaccinated so they can't carry it, they can't give it to you. That's the goal. And that's what we were able to do with smallpox, but it took a lot longer to generate the smallpox vaccine than COVID-19 because we have things like the internet now. Think of all the scientists that work on it. If you're working and having to redo all the work over and over and over, it's gonna take forever. But if they're working here and they're working here and they're working here and they're working here and everybody starts working together, then it goes much faster. So with all these people working together on the COVID vaccine, we're able to develop it faster. We're able to test it. We're able to um, make sure it's safe. We're able to get through all that red tape and bureaucracy. And that's how we were able to develop it so quickly. Now, could we develop other vaccines this quickly? Now we could, yes, but here with smallpox, this took years and years to develop. So we're actually kind of lucky that we're able to develop this the way it is now. Um, we will look at having less deaths than they did in 1918 overall, worldwide, um, we, but we've still had a ton of deaths already with this. So we're getting there. Question was asked, um, does the genome length contribute to the variety of symptoms? There's still a lot of study being done on that. So we're not really exactly sure how. We know that there can be a very small genome which can produce a whole bunch of proteins and genes going on there. And then we can have a very large genome which doesn't produce as much. So the length of the genome really doesn't have um, a correlation to how complex something is, okay? All right, so that's a lot on COVID. Um, do you guys have questions before I kind of move on? A lot of people have asked, are the vaccines safe? Yes, they are not distributed to the public without being safe. Have people had allergic reactions? Yes, but people have allergic reactions to strawberries. That doesn't mean we stop selling strawberries. Um, allergic reactions are going to happen in the world and it's about the number of reactions and if it makes sense with the number of doses being given. The number of reactions compared to doses given is minute, it's very tiny. The chances of having an allergic reaction is very small and um, from what I've read, everyone who's had an allergic reaction already had existing allergies and were being monitored anyway because they knew there could be a reaction. They could have any vaccine and might have had a reaction. Is one vaccine better than another? No. The best vaccine is whichever one you can uh, be administered. It doesn't matter. They're all telling your body how to fight and that's good. I personally, I had the Pfizer. Does it matter? No. I went to county hospital over here to have my vaccine. Um, if you're concerned about the, the symptoms of the second dose, I can tell you that teachers I work with at Valley View, I've talked to people who've had no reaction at all to either dose. They're completely fine. 
And does that mean their body doesn't know what to do? No, it just means their body reacted a little differently. That's all. Um, all the way to the worst reaction I've seen so far is having about two days where you just don't want to move or get out of it because you just, that the fever, fevers are just not fun. They make you very uncomfortable, um, but that's about it. So think of a, a flu or a cold that you have for two days. But even then, you're not, it's not the sinus stuff, you're not congested or any of those. It's just the achy and I don't want to do anything. Okay, it looks like no other questions popping up yet. If you think of any, let me know. This stuff is important to understand. And you guys, um, this is actually really very cool that you're in AP Bio right now while this is happening, because as we go through this, you'll understand more about how this works and how it affects the body and all those things, especially in the next, like say three weeks as we're talking about this stuff. Um, and then when people ask, you'll have, you'll have that information. So again, a bacteria phage is a virus that infects a bacteria. So it injects its DNA into a bacteria. And we can look at the life cycle of a virus. And there are two different types. Now your um, gizmo is on the lytic cycle, okay? And it's really not that complicated. So we have, uh, let's see, I'm gonna kind of Skip along. We have lytic, lysogenic, and temperate, which uses both. So we have two life cycles. The first one is what we call a lytic. Okay, the lytic life cycle of a T4 phage means that it attaches, it injects, it takes over. Eventually, we make so many viruses, it pops like a water balloon. Okay, so we attach, we inject, we take over, we make more, we explode. Now, what happens here? So we take over this cell, we make a whole bunch of viruses, it explodes, and those go find other cells. So we, we have infected one cell, which can then go on to affect hundreds of others. So again, it's pretty easy. We infect, we take over, we explode. The lysogenic cycle is a little bit different in that it's longer. We infect, but instead of taking over right away, it becomes part of the cell's DNA, okay? So we become part of the cell's DNA here. Then that cell is gonna just kind of do its thing. It's gonna grow, it's gonna divide, it's gonna make more copies. So one cell that was infected becomes two cells, but we've copied that bad DNA. Then four, eight, 16, 64, nope, I skipped 32. 32, then 64. Uh, and you can see that it just, the number keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. At this point, there would be no problems, no symptoms, no nothing going on. And then it gets triggered like a sleeper cell. It's just hanging out and growing. Then it gets triggered to take over and produce a whole bunch and then explode. So here we're going to have a steady increase over and over and over and over with the lytic. Whereas the lysogenic it takes a while, not gonna see a whole lot. And then all of a sudden, boom, all kinds of virus all over the place, okay? So two different cycles, the short one is the short word. So lytic, shorter word, shorter cycle, it just starts doing its thing. Lysogenic, longer, it takes longer. They divide and divide, then we start making the viruses and explode. Animal viruses have a membranous envelope. Now this envelope allows the virus to like trick the other cells. So it gets into a host cell. We make more of these viruses and as it goes out, it pulls a piece of that membrane with it. Remember we talked about exocytosis. We basically pushed a bubble of that membrane out and whatever was inside got wrapped in that membrane. Okay, that's happening here. So now this has host membrane. So it gets into your lung cell, but now it has the same membrane. So when it goes over to new cells, the new cells are like, okay, we know you, that's the same membrane we have, we're good. And it's more likely to allow it to attach. This makes it a problem. A retrovirus, Met retro means kind of going back, going backward. So, 
an RNA virus that uses reverse transcriptase. And we're going to talk about what transcriptase is in our next um, lesson. So here we're going to go RNA to DNA. Normally, it's the other way around. We go from DNA and work our way to protein. But here we have to go RNA to DNA and then back. And an example of this is HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. Now, HIV is, again, it's a retrovirus. So it's RNA that has to be made into DNA. And once it's made into DNA, the cell sees it as its own. It takes it and it's like, sure. And it keeps making more and more copies of this. Okay, so again, it can kind of hide in the cells because it's got the DNA embedded inside the um, host DNA. Then it can make copies and send them out. So here you can see HIV infecting a white blood cell. Eventually when they come out, they actually have that own cells membrane, making it harder for the body to tell that it's something that shouldn't be there. Now, if we say someone is HIV positive, that means that the cells have the HIV DNA in them, hanging out. Someone can be HIV positive and not be sick for a very long time. Okay, AIDS is when they're actually producing those viruses and are sick, okay? So that's the difference between HIV positive and AIDS. A lot of people are like, but it's the same thing. Mm, kind of not really. HIV positive means it's there, but it's hiding. It's just waiting. It's in the cells, but it's not doing anything. AIDS is when it actually starts doing something, okay? And there's active viral production. Now, you may have seen in uh, news that they have people that have been cured of HIV. What that means is that their viral load, so the AIDS production, is down to nothing or very close to nothing. Okay, So they're not able to detect HIV within the system. Now, other human viruses, again, include smallpox, which is incredibly painful, all these little bumps and stuff. Um, are all painful. It also produces a very high fever, which is deadly. And again, we eradicated it in 1979, which is awesome. It's actually been eradicated to the point where we don't even vaccinate for it anymore because the chances of you coming into contact with it are so small that we don't even bother. Now, one that you guys may have seen or come into contact with is um, the herpes virus. There are different versions of this. And if you've heard of chickenpox, chickenpox is one of the herpes viruses. Um, they all produce basically like cold sores. So it creates, starts as like a little blister on the skin. That blister then will erupt and then kind of crust over. And there are several different versions. Again, there is chickenpox. There is herpes simplex one and herpes simplex two. Um, simplex one is when you see cold sores along the, the mouth. It lives at the root of the nerve. So it lives in the cell, the nerve cells, and then it produces enough of them that it'll rupture, okay? Whereas other viruses don't do that. So that it, this lives there and it comes back and goes away, comes back, goes away. So that is, we have oral herpes, we have genital herpes are the same kind of thing, okay? And then chicken pox do the same thing. They're just all over the body. Okay, general rule of thumb, if it's oozing or crusty, don't touch it, whether it's yours or somebody else's. Okay, general rule of thumb. Um, question was just asked for retroviruses. Okay, do they permanently alter your DNA? They only alter the DNA of the cell that they get into. So they can't go to all your cells. So like these would alter only the white blood cells it gets to, any new white blood cell is not infected, isn't changed. So it's only the cells that can get to. Okay. So back to here to herpes. Um, so just like these can go away and come back, chickenpox can do the same thing. So somebody can have chickenpox, it goes away, and then it can come back later and we call that shingles. And it usually comes back in just a little spot where it kind of was hiding, but it can be very painful. Okay, so that's, we know that that happens. We can give them medication to help reduce that viral load so their body isn't producing as much of those. Can the affected cells by retroviruses be recycled? Um, yes, however, 
it is usually seen by the body as a damaged cell. And so it's not like it reuses all of those pieces. It's not like it's gonna take that viral DNA and use it again. So viral RNA, viral DNA is made of the same components of other DNA. So we break it down to its basic building blocks. So everything's made out of Legos and it's what the Legos are shaped in that is a difference. So if we break everything down to a, its individual Lego, we can use it again and it's safe, it doesn't matter. And that'll make more sense after our next uh, lesson on the parts of DNA. Okay, very good question. So again, vaccines work by giving you a part of the pathogen or the thing that makes you sick that's either dead, weak, or inactive so that the immune system sees it, knows what it is, and can fight it before it can make you sick. We talked about these emerging viruses and COVID-19 is not like a new thing that we would have a virus like this. We've seen things like this before. It's just that they were not as easy to transmit. And so they didn't make people as sick. We didn't spread it as often and we locked it down really fast. Okay. Viroids. These are small circular RNA molecules that infect a plant. Plants can get sick but they don't like cough, you know, we're not seeing trees out there sneezing, that would be scary. So instead what happens is it causes problems with regulatory control, okay, and growth. In the Philippines, they had a problem with the coconut palms for a while where they were being infected and they were actually causing the palm fronds, so the leaves, to die. They weren't growing properly, they would fall off and die. And if your plant doesn't have any leaves, it can't capture any sunlight and do photosynthesis, that means the tree's going to die. So plants can get sick too. They can also get cancer. Prion. A prion is a misfolded protein. So we have those four levels of protein folding. If it doesn't fold properly, it can mean that the attachment points around the outside, so the bonding areas around the outside of the protein, are inaccurate and it can like bunch up tight and that can cause other proteins to like stick to it and it makes them very sticky and clumpy. So these prions cause misfolding of other proteins and they stick to them and eventually what should have been a bunch of small proteins winds up being clumps or aggregates of these prions and this causes huge problems in the brain. And we see this in what we call uh, BSE or mad cow disease. It's bovine spongoencephalopathy. Cephalo cephalopathy. There we go. Uh, Kritzfeld Jakob disease and scrappy. It's all the same thing. It's just a little different. Like this is in cows, this is in people, this is in sheep. Now, how do you, how do cows get mad cow disease? By consuming prions. Now, to consume a prion, that means it came from something that had a prion, which would be things like cow with prion. So a cow consumed a cow with prions. Generally, we would see this in brain tissue. Okay, It's in the brain tissue. So let that sink in a second. That means cows were eating cow brains. What? Yeah, so what happens is we have cattle ranchers and you're slaughtering your cattle to be able to feed people, which is awesome but you have to feed those cattle so they can grow big. So what do you feed them? Well, you have leftovers from when you slaughtered the cows. That's free protein. So they grind it up and feed it back to the cattle as a protein source. That is illegal now. We do not import from any country that will allow that. Um, we do not allow that in the United States. Um, we've actually like stopped importing from countries that have had positive tests for a mad cow and their cattle um, until it's cleared. They actually research it. There was one a couple of years ago from Canada and it was, uh, they actually research it back to the specific cow, all kinds of crazy things. But if any meat is contaminated with that, so let's say that they grind this in a um, slaughterhouse and then they have steaks come down. Well, now the steaks that came through there are going to be contaminated. Um, and then that can go to people and then people can wind up with mad cow disease. We call it Kutzfeld-Jakob. Um, sheep, same kinds of things. 
they have seen this in small tribes in Africa that part of their belief system was to, in order to help keep someone within the tribe when they died, it was customary that small pieces of the brain were eaten by every tribal member. So that in essence kept that person within the tribe. That was their belief. So through some intervention, most of that is, is been eliminated. So that doesn't happen anymore, but it was causing this same disease to happen within those tribes. Now, diseases caused by this, prions act very, very slowly. They actually, it takes them about 10 years before you start seeing any symptoms. So you get infected and then it builds and grows within the body and it takes about 10 years to figure out that you've been infected, okay? They're virtually indestructible. That means that if meat is contaminated, just cooking it to like a high enough temperature, like you would do for anything that would cause normal uh, food poisoning or something like that, it's not gonna kill it. It can't, you can't kill it. It stays in the meat. That's why we do not allow this to happen because contaminated meat is dangerous no matter what. There's no way to uh, reduce that. Question was asked, does the incubation period vary by species? It does, but it is a very long time period. And even like with cattle, it's gonna be several years um, their lifespan is shorter. It doesn't take quite as long to appear, but it, it does usually take several years. There are no known cures for prion disease. What happens is the brain actually starts to shrink up. Okay? It shrinks and causes like holes, like sponge, like a sponge, and which causes deterioration. Um, they can't control the body, the thought processes, all the brains just deteriorating. So prions are not living. No, they are just proteins. So it's just a protein that's all bunched together and causes other things to bunch together and then they can't do their job right and it gets stuck in the brain and it causes the brain to shrink and get these holes in it. Okay. So that is our whole uh, lesson on bacteria and viruses. Do you guys have questions? Whether it's about COVID-19, HIV, viruses, bacteria. How does HIV stay undetected? That's a good question. Okay, let me go back to my HIV slide. So when HIV infects the cells, it is um, attacking our white blood cells. It goes into the cell, it is then read by the cell and it like stays hidden in there. So it stays within the cell and until there is enough of it in the body of the virus, when we do a blood test, we don't see it. Now, when they first started detecting HIV, the technology was not available to detect it right away. Now you can detect it pretty soon. They usually do a test I believe if you might have been infected, if you know you might have been infected, they usually do a test right away. And then again, in about six months, just to make sure that you haven't been infected. Um, be and because it can hide inside the cells, that's why we can't find it or detect it. It's only until it's here because it's a protein and this only, it can't hide in our blood testing. And how does it know when to activate it? There's, it's not, uh, there's no like real timer or anything. They're really not sure if we could figure that out, we could like break it. So that's still something we have to try to try to work on. Now, when we talk about DNA um, in our next lesson, we are gonna talk about how our DNA has like lifetime limits on it, okay? But this does kind of like break those ideas as well. What is the biological purpose of a prion if it isn't even alive? Um, the biological purpose of a prion, it may not have a purpose. It, just because something isn't working uh, to help an organism doesn't mean it's going to necessarily go away. So in the case of prions, if and we had a species that had a prion disease, let's say it's cattle. Prion disease 
is going to become is going to come from eating infected meat. Well, if humans did not interfere, cattle would not eat other dead cattle. So it wouldn't perpetuate. Okay. Um, it did perpetuate in those societies that had the uh, the custom of eating tribal member brains. And it wasn't until there was intervention that that stopped. So those the it actually caused shrinking of that society. So there were fewer and fewer members. So it's a bad thing, which means that that is going to reduce the numbers. And when we talk about natural selection in our next unit, you'll see that that kind of like takes care of itself when it's a bad thing, okay? Now, what biological purpose does a virus have? Um, it's an evolutionary thing. You'll see that all of this comes down to evolution and natural selection. Is there a, um, I mean, viruses do allow for introducing genetic variation. So could a virus introduce something that's beneficial? Maybe. Um, it, there's, what is the purpose to having a gopher? What is the purpose to having seagulls? Is there something else that could take its place? Yes. Uh, are, we haven't even decided whether or not viruses are alive. You could line up a hundred scientists and you'd have about 50 of them tell you that it's alive and about 50 that tell you it's not alive. So that's, that's a really difficult question to answer. I'm sorry, that's not very useful. Other questions? All right, I will do my best to get this video posted today. I hope you guys, um, if you have questions, will let me know. Please make sure to get your gizmo done as soon as possible. Uh, this is viruses and bacteria. And our next lesson is gonna be on DNA structure and DNA replication so that we can start moving into how that actually means something for your body and for the world around you. Okay, all right, you guys are awesome. I will see you tomorrow. Bye everybody.